go into the chat and and give me a yes. Uh, we don't have polling today, but that's okay. I've got a couple of questions for you as we get started, and you can either throw a thumbs up uh, reaction, give me a yes in the chat. Uh, we're going to have plenty of time to converse today. I do have a lot of information for you, so hang on tight. A little bit of housekeeping as we get started with our housekeeping. I've got a question for you, and you can go ahead and, and put these answers in the chat for me, if you would. Where are you in your business journey? Are you just starting out? Are you trying to expand? Is this still just a germ of an idea in your head? Is this something that has been rattling around up there in the old noggin for a while, and you think maybe it's time to get started? So just let us know where you are. Give me uh, some indication here because I've got a little something for everyone today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so that we can jump into the slides, but I don't want you to feel like you have to write everything down. I'm going to give you a link at the end that will have all of these slides in PDF format. So you can download this pretty easily. They're very content rich, so there may be some things that you want to hang on to and refer back to later on. Uh, don't Again, don't feel like you have to take screenshots and keep your camera aimed at the computer screen and things like that. So it seems like we've got some folks who are starting. Uh, we've got somebody who's five years in wanting to expand. Fantastic. Uh, ready to seek funding for growth. Medical claims clearinghouse. Okay. Part-time business that started as a hobby. Oh. You need to find a new hobby. <laughs> if you start a business from a hobby, it is no longer a hobby anymore. It just will cease to be as fun. So yeah, we've got some expansions. We've got some startups, a good range of, of uh, experiences in here. Tell me a little bit about, uh, are you selling products, services, or both? Are you selling products, services, or both? If you could give me a little bit of information on that. I'm going to go ahead and jump over here and tell you why you should be listening to me today. Of course, you don't have to, but I've been doing this a long time and I have sat on both sides of the table. I have over 20 years. This really should update. This is closer to 25 years helping businesses start and grow. I started out in the consumer lending industry in 1992. So 31 years ago. Wow. Uh, I started out making loans for sewing machines and vacuum cleaners and big screen TVs as they were back then. They weighed 6,000 pounds in the early 90s. If you could get a big screen TV, most of them were the Curtis Mathis televisions. If you remember the consoles that were a piece of furniture. Uh, and so I've, I've been doing this a while, uh, did some mortgage lending, got out of it for a while because I wanted to run my own business. And I did that. For several years, really enjoyed it, uh, had some successes, had some failures, but learned a lot and spent about 12 years as a consultant to small businesses. Then I came over to the Sequoia Fund, uh, started working the Sequoia Fund in 2009, and we are a native CDFI that serves the Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians in Western North Carolina. And we, we if I do say so myself, we do it really, really well. And so I have been on both sides of the table. I've borrowed money. I have been in a position of just needing money to survive, needing money to expand, but also lending money to small businesses. So we do small business loans, startup and expansion. That's our sweet spot. But we're very proud to serve the Eastern Band of Cherokee uh, and the business growth that they're experiencing. So, okay, we got some products. We've got some wholesale products, retail, retail gift shops, uh, art. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and get out of the chat here for a second. And I see, Cheryl, you still have your hand raised. Is there, is, if you have a question, go ahead and put that in the chat or the Q&A for me. And we will make sure to get to that. We're going to cover a lot of ground today. As Jerry Reed sang in the theme song to Smokey and the Bandit, we got a long way to go and a short time to get there. We are going to stop about halfway through today. Take a five minute break, stretch your legs, get away from the computer screen for a little while, and uh, we'll come right back to it. Uh, it may not be exactly the halfway point, but it's a pretty good break point for us to, to just stop and, and stretch our legs. We're gonna talk about how lenders look at you. 
and your business idea. There's a very narrow lens through which lenders look, most traditional lenders, that is. I'm also going to tell you how native lenders look at you. Native CDFIs have a very different lens, and it's very helpful to those in Indian country who are looking to start businesses. How to look good on paper. Unfortunately, our lives are boiled down to a three-digit code, and we have to make that three-digit <laughs> make that three-digit number look as good as possible. And if it doesn't look great, there are other ways that we can look good on paper to pique the interest of a lender, of an investor, someone out there who's going to help us with the money we need. There are all kinds of non-bank lending sources, and they want to say yes. We're one of them. We, of course, we can only lend to Eastern Band of Cherokee in Western North Carolina, but there are others like us out there, and I'm going to point you toward them because they want to say yes. We're going to talk about the two most important financial metrics that you need to include in your business plan. I'm going to give you a very brief outline of a business plan, and at the end, you're going to have a link to a fill-in-the-blank business plan template that we've created that you can use. It's a great way to get what's in your head on paper and get started and moving in the right direction. But uh, there are a lot of people who will give you misinformation and make you do way too much work as you do the financial planning for your uh, financing package. There are really only two things you need. We're going to cover those. You need to develop a plan for when things go wrong. We're used to that. But what about when things go too right? Yep. Lenders want to know what's going to happen if things burst at the seams, and get too good too fast. And how to navigate lending and borrowing in a post-COVID world. COVID almost broke us in more ways than one, and it has changed the way people borrow money forever. I don't think we're ever going to go back to the way it was, and I'm not sure that's necessarily a bad thing. But we're going to talk about what that means. Okay. Why can't you always bank on banks? Well, look, banks are the first place we send people. When someone walks in the door, the Sequoia Fund was built, as all CDFIs are, as a lender of last resort. We were not meant to be the first stop in your funding journey. But... Over time, and through our stellar reputation, we have become the first place people come for money. And often, we have to send them away to a bank first. Why? Why would we do that? Why would we send someone else or send people to someone else to borrow money? Well, we bank with banks just like you do. We have deposits. We, we have investment accounts. We have things that we need banks for that banks are uniquely positioned to do. We have a good relationship with our banks. Our goal is to help our borrowers become bankable. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment, about why it's important that you become bankable. There are all kinds of benefits to being bankable. But when someone walks in the door and they say, I want to borrow money to start a business or grow my business, we send them to the bank. We have a good relationship with the bank and we want to maintain that. We don't want to be poaching their potential customers. So, if your credit is too good, <laughs> yeah, if you have great credit, you may not belong with us. You may have a better chance at the bank. Now, we'll talk about all the reasons bankers might tell you no, and it doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean they hate your idea or that your idea stinks. It may just mean they have to say no. When they do that, then people can come back to us. But a startup has no track record. Almost universally, as a business startup, you are going to be seen as a huge risk. Look, when you when you borrow money for a home, yes, it's a long process. It's a it's a it's an aggravating process, and it's very frustrating sometimes because you know that the day of closing, if you're going to close at two o'clock in the afternoon. At one o'clock, they're going to be asking for a pint of blood. They're going to be asking you for documents and information and things that you have to dig up out of an old box in the garage somewhere. And up to the minute of closing, they're going to be needing new things. So it is a very frustrating process. But 
banks love mortgages because there's usually a piece of property or there's a home, there's a building, there's some structure, there's real estate. It's called real estate because it's real. It's tangible. We can touch it. We can feel it. We can walk by it. We can burn it down. It is there. And banks know that if you can't pay your mortgage, they'll have this piece of property that they can turn around and resell. I don't know if you've noticed, but they're not making any more of it. So real property is valuable. Banks get it. The same thing holds for your car. It's a little easier process to buy a car. Of course, 2020, 2021 broke the car industry. If you've tried to buy a car recently, you know it's not like it was before COVID. But again, look, if you default on your loan, I know I'm going to be able to get your car from you and I can sell it. It has a value. There are agencies out there, uh, the NADA, Kelly Blue Book, others that determine based on the condition, the age, and the mileage of that vehicle, what is it going to be worth? That's easy. Uh, realtors can tell me based on appraisal and tax value what that property is going to be worth. Okay. Those are easy to understand as a lender, but as a business, as a startup, you're taking something that only exists in your mind and you're having to show me at the lender how it's going to make money, how it's going to pay its bills, how it's going to pay you to put groceries on the table and pay your own mortgage. That's a tall order to take something that doesn't exist and prove that it's going to work. Wow. A lot of people discount just what an amazing process that is. And they say things like, oh, there's no risk. I'll be fine. This has been a hobby of mine for years. All my friends will buy from me. My mother thinks I'm smart and I'm beautiful and I'm great. And of course, she thinks this is the greatest idea ever. Look, you have no track record. You have no sales. Everything that you're doing is a guess. It's your best educated guess, but it's still a guess. And banks want certainty. They want things that are concrete that they can know, that they can sink their teeth into. Now, banks also want collateral. We're going to talk a little bit more about collateral, but they're probably going to want more than you have available. If you need $100,000 for this project, they're going to ask for value of $110,000. Give me something that's worth $110,000, $120,000, Because as a small business startup, you generally have no assets. And a lot of service businesses, a lot of small businesses, even after you've been in business for a while, you don't have a lot of assets. You may have a service business. You may have a billing business. The only asset you have are your customers and your computer. You Maybe running this out of your basement, out of a walk-in closet in your home, or just from your dining room table. But you don't have a lot of assets that belong to the business. So collateral is a big issue. You also have no established pattern of cash flow. Now, this is really tough, especially for businesses that are going into seasonal industries. Maybe they're going into the attractions industry where people are only going to come when they're on vacation. Maybe you're starting a restaurant. Maybe you're starting an educational business. Anything that has an ebb and flow to it is even more troublesome for a lender because not only do you have no cash flow track record, but you don't even know what those cycles are going to look like. Everything is so unpredictable. Maybe as a founder, you have either an inadequate credit history or you have a poor credit history. So let me stop right here and just say that, if, and, and I'm not going to make anybody confess. Look, confession is good for the soul, but let's keep it to ourselves. You know who you are. If everything in your life is crashing around you, you've lost your job, your prospects aren't great, you're about to be foreclosed on your kids are hitting you up for money, whatever it is. Starting a business is not going to pull your ox out of the ditch. Starting a business might make your financial situation worse. So if you already have a bad credit history or an inadequate credit history, let's work on that. I'm going to give you some pointers on how to do that. But there's an old saying that bankers lend money to people, not businesses. 
They couldn't care less about your business, especially if you're a startup. They want to know you. This is a relationship business like every other business in the world. They want to know you. And I'm going to talk to you in a little while about how to build relationships with those lenders to increase your chances of getting money. But just remember, you and the business, it doesn't matter if you form an LLC or a corporation, you and the business are one in the mind of the lender. Because without you, there is no business. Also, look, it's 2023. Traditional bankers, folks with a little bit of this gray stuff in their beard, they like traditional business plans. I want to see a business plan that looks like every business plan I've ever approved for the last 50 years. But today's business plans don't fit the mold. One of the best business plans I've ever seen was a laminated front and back one page business plan. On the front, I got the entire history, the story of the business. On the back, I got the financials and the projections and exactly what they needed the money for and how much they needed. It was perfect. Walk into a bank with that business plan and they will laugh you out the door. They're not used to it. But we have millennials now who are there. Even millennials are starting to get a little gray in the beard. But Gen Z is coming up behind them. We've got generations that are not going to sit down and write a 50-page business plan. It's just not going to happen. But they're still going to sit down across the table from baby boomer bankers. So there's a there's a there's there's not a great fit there. Well, I want you to write down a number. And this may be the only thing you have to write down today. Uh, I'm not going to make you write a lot because, again, we've got these, we've got these content-rich slides. But I want you to write down the number 15, 1, 5, 15. If your business plan is more than 15 pages, I can guarantee no one will read it. Your business plan is not the guarantee that you're going to get money. But if it's not done right, it will guarantee that you won't. Keep it to 15 pages or less. Samuel Clemens, you might know him as Mark Twain. He once told a friend, I would have written you a shorter letter but I didn't have time. He knew that editing and making everything brief and concise was much more difficult than just spewing words out on paper. So don't say in a paragraph what you could say in a sentence. Keep it simple. And uh, look, even those guys with the gray in our beards, we're going to really appreciate that because now we're going to read those plans. How do banks look at you? How do lenders look at us? Well, these are called the five C's of credit. Everything in our life, as I said before, gets boiled down to a three-digit number. It's called your credit score. Don't ask your banker how they calculate your credit score. They'll give you some generalizations like, well, it, it's based on your open credit, your credit utilization. It's based on the amount of credit you've got. Uh, open right now and how long you've had that credit available to you, the types of credit, blah, blah, but they don't know. This is like the formula to Coca-Cola. No one person knows it. It's, it's stored in vaults and safes all over the place, and it comes together in this little algorithm. It's a math formula that says TransUnion is going to calculate your score this way. Equifax is going to score it another way, and Experian is going to use a different formula. And they all come up with different numbers. Politicians are trying to work this out. They're trying to make it so that in the next couple of years, we may be looking at something like a grade school credit card. It's going to be much easier for us to understand. You'll have A plus credit. You'll have C minus credit. You'll have B, B plus credit, whatever it is. But you will know that it's a uniform formula that's applied to everyone the same way, and it is going to be much easier. But for now, as we're sitting here now, we've got a very convoluted math formula. And Cheryl, I see your hands up. You have a question for me. You can go ahead and unmute and ask. I think her hand hasn't went down, Russ. Oh, okay. Okay. I just saw the I just saw the notification pop up. So just didn't know. Thought thought it was a new one. Okay. Um, so 
look, there are there are five things that go into creating that credit score. And number one is character. If I look at your credit report and I see that you have charge offs, that you have write offs, that you have collections, that you have foreclosures, that you have repossessions, that you have things that you've obligated yourself to pay and you've decided I'm not going to pay them. What this says is, are you the kind of person who keeps promises? If you make a promise to pay, are you going to pay? If you have a high credit score, that says, yes, this person keeps promises. If you have a very low credit score, it says, no, you don't. But wait, there's more. No one who I know, I've not met anyone in, in, in 55 years who says, you know what? I think I'm going to have a heart attack on my commute to work this morning. I think on the way home, I'm going to get distracted and I'm going to wrap my car around a tree or I'm going to step out in front of a bus or I'm going to have a stroke. Look, life happens. Things happen. And when we look at, you know, did this person wake up one morning and say, I'm going to get the man. I'm just never going to pay my bills again. Or is it because of a life event that was out of their control? That doesn't say that you're a bad person. Your credit score alone says something happened to you. We can explain it. Number two is capacity. Capacity. Does your business have the capacity to pay its bills? Does your business, will your business, have the capacity to generate cash flow? Look, it's, there's a joke, a running joke in the banking industry that banks don't care if you ever make a profit. All they care about is, can you make your payment? Do you have that capacity? If you can't show sufficient cash flow, it doesn't matter what world-changing idea you have. If not enough people are willing to pay you little green pictures of dead presidents, you won't stay in business. Number three is capital. We're going to look at how much money you're putting into the business. How much capital can you bring to the project? And some Banks may may expect 50% or more. If you need $100,000 to get started, they might be willing to lend you 50 as long as you bring 50,000 of your own money to the table. And I can tell you that native lenders generally do not fall into that category. We want you to have some skin in the game, so to speak. We want you to believe in yourself and make a bet on yourself. And that's all this is, folks. Capital is a bet on yourself. The rationale there is if you're not willing to bet on yourself, why would you expect us to place a 100% bet on you? In fairness, I see the point. I would want to know that my idea is good enough for me to put my own money in. And if I don't believe in me, why should you? Number four is conditions. What does the economy look like for your business? If you are in an area that depends on tourism and tourism is down, maybe the conditions aren't right for your business. Maybe uh, the economy hasn't been very friendly to businesses like yours. Uh, let's look at the restaurant industry right now. Restaurants all over the world are struggling for labor. There were so many people who exited the workforce during COVID and have not come back. Now, these are these are retirees. These are semi-retirees. These are post-retirees. These are uh, school-age people. Um, the labor participation between age 16 and 24 is the lowest it has ever been right now. In other words, kids aren't working. They're playing ball. They're going to school. They're hanging out with their friends, but they're not working jobs. So if I... I'm wanting to start a restaurant that is going to require me to hire 70 people. Can I do that? Is that going to make sense? And then last but not least is collateral. Collateral is the last thing on the list because it's the thing that means the least. Yes, banks are going to ask for a lot of it. Traditional lenders are going to want you to bring it in boatloads. But it doesn't mean anything. They don't want your collateral. I don't want collateral. I don't want to have to go pick it up, put it on a on a truck, haul it out, store it, secure it, insure it, advertise it, try to sell it. 
do the math on what do you owe me now that I've, I've taken something that wasn't worth what we picked up, or I have to cut you a check because we have an excess of funds after selling. So we don't want to be in the stuff business. Here is why collateral is important. It's the stuff you're willing to fight to keep. Period. Collateral is the stuff you're willing to fight to keep. Your vehicle, your home, the land that grandma gave you when she passed away, your commercial oven, you know, all of those things are good collateral. They have value and you're willing to fight to keep them. The boat that's been sitting in your backyard for the last 10 years, that's a project, but it's not collateral. No one wants that. So evaluate your collateral. How do we look good on paper? Well, let's let's take a look at this. Take time. If your credit score is low, if you have too many open credit cards, if you have access to too much credit, the lender is going to say, well, why don't you just borrow on these 17 credit cards you have open? Look, I've done it, folks. I have borrowed money on credit cards. I do not recommend it to start a business. It's a very easy way to get the money you need, and it's the most expensive way, short of a loan shark. At least the credit card companies are not going to come after you with a baseball bat. That's the only difference, but the, the money you're going to spend to use that money is off the charts. But that's what the bank is going to think. You've got 17 open credit cards. Why don't you just run up the balances on those? Don't make us add to that. Get your financial house in order. It may take you a year. It may take you three years. But trust me, being patient and getting your house in order and shoring up your credit score, making sure your, your bank account gets reconciled every month, making sure that you keep all of your receipts that you have that you have good record keeping habits once you start to build those habits you're more likely to be able to get the money plus we have found that people who do not have good personal record keeping habits you know i never balance my checkbook i uh as long as i've got checks in my checkbook i've got money in the bank and I, i'll i'll go out and eat and i'll just swipe my card or i'll tap my phone my apple pay uh, and hope there's money there. Look, that's no way to live. Banks want to know that you have good money habits. Take time to do that. Your business idea, if it's a good business idea, it will be a good business idea in three years. It'll be a good idea in two years, maybe one year. If it's not going to be a good idea that will wait for you to get your financial house in order, why are you wanting to start now? It may only, you know, if it's, if it's a bad idea, it's only going to wreck you in that amount of time. Take your time. Build good money habits. Work on your credit score. Be diligent about it. Reduce your debt. Cut down on your debt obligation because the number one thing that, that banks are going to look at is what's called your debt to income ratio. In other words, how comfortable are you with debt? If you make $100 and you have you automatically run up $100 of debt and you know that that $100 is going to be used to pay that debt. And I borrow another $100 and I'm going to make $100. If I'm really, really comfortable having a high debt to income ratio, that probably not going to look real good to a bank. I need to be very uncomfortable with debt. I need to be uncomfortable enough with debt that I want to keep it paid down. Set aside some cash. Start building your capital. Start building that capital that we talked about so that you can bring some of your own money to bet on yourself. Evaluate the collateral value. You may have to have something appraised. You may have to pay five or $600 to have a piece of property appraised. It might be worth it to do that. And most of all, know your industry. Know the industry. Who, who else is in your industry? What does their debt look like? How much debt are they carrying? How are they financed? How does everybody else in the industry do this? That's probably a pretty good indicator of how you're going to have to do this. Does everybody else in the, in the industry have 
uh, a line of credit, which means you 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 get a certain amount of money and you can borrow up to that limit and then you pay it down and then you borrow up and then you pay it down and then you let it rest for a while and then you do it again. Or is everybody in your industry doing something called factoring? Factoring is where I'm going to sell a lot of stuff. I'm going to take this big handful of invoices that I may not get paid for and I'm going to hand them to the factor and the factor is going to pay me 80%, 90%, maybe even 70% of the value of those invoices. But now I've got cash and I can go do it again. And the, the customers pay the factor. If everybody is doing that, is that how you want to do it? Is that how you should do it? Are you comfortable doing it that way? Know your industry. Now, the Indian Collective has done an amazing job creating this, and I give them all the credit because they have flipped the script for how we look at credit in Indian country. I've given you their URL. If you want to jot that down, if you want to go visit them, they're doing some amazing work. And, and I'm, 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 I'm borrowing this because this is something we have started using at Sequoia Fund. It makes so much sense to do this that uh, we, we wonder how were we doing this before? Because when we look at native borrowers, a lot of times we run into those collateral issues. There is zero collateral. We run into capital issues. There's just not enough there. I want to place a bet on myself, but I just don't have the money. There are other things that happen. Maybe the character issue is I co-signed a vehicle for my daughter. She moved out of state. She quit paying. She didn't tell me, and I never got communication until my credit was ruined. Does that make me a bad person? No. Maybe maybe I should have asked more questions. Maybe I should have kept up with what's going on more. But it's not like I woke up one day and said, screw the system. I'm not going to pay anymore. My daughter and I are going to have some hard conversations. But it's not a gauge of my character. So here are the five R's of native credit. Is it relational? Is this a relationship business? Is this a business that, that can benefit the community? Is this a business that is going to uh, be around for a while that we can that we can say, yeah, when, I, when we need this service or this, this product, we're going to call this business. Are there relationships there? Or is it just someone who blew into the community and says, I'm here to make a buck? Now, I don't know if you can tell by my accent, but I'm from LA, Lower Appalachia, and down here in the more, in the mountains, we, we've we've got a a, a different uh, way of looking at people, and and you know we used to call them carpetbaggers as people who would come in and and want to tell us how to do things and how we need to do things and and uh, how you're not doing things right around here, uh, and um, so we're looking for people who want relationships in the community. Is it rooted in community values? In Cherokee, there are the seven core Cherokee values. And we look at, you know, are they are they rooted in those values? Or is this just a quick money-making scheme? Is this something that is going to go against the values of the community? Does it not make any sense for this business to be here? And that doesn't mean that it's not a good business. It might make perfect sense for it to exist somewhere else, but it may not be right here. So let me just stop and say this. Most CDFIs and the CDFIs I've talked to, uh, and certainly Sequoia Fund, we, we look at it this way. If we have to say no, it's probably not a forever no. It might mean not right here, not right now, not this way. Let's figure something out. This might not be the place to do it. It might not be the time to do it. There might be a fundamental flaw in your business plan. Let's fix that. So when we look at is a business rooted, we want to know, is this the right place? Is this the right time for you to do this? Banks need a thousand reasons to say yes. They only need one reason to say no. And in native finance, again, we flip that script. We're looking at this as how can we make this happen? How can we make your dream come true? How can we help you improve yours and your family's financial condition? How can we do that? How can we help you employ your family, your people, your community? How can we help you do this? 
And we're going to need more than one reason to say no. Is the business restorative? Is it bringing something back to the community? Is it helping people with jobs? Is it helping people uh, restore pride in themselves? Is it helping people uh, regain trust? Is there something about this business that re that is restorative, not just for the owner, for employees, for the community? Is it regenerative? Does it have the ability to move forward, to grow, to keep going, to bounce back from from upsets, uh, from setbacks. This you could equate uh, to the um, conditions, kind of fits into that. But we're looking at uh, does it does it have the ability to uh, mold itself to the times, adjust to circumstances and keep going. It's what I call the hockey goalie mentality. I used to have a, a well, I still have a nephew. I can't say I used to have a nephew. My nephew used to be a soccer goalie and he got to be very, very good. But the first couple of years he played that position, he got very much in his head. The The ball would get by him. Someone would score a goal on him and he would just, oh, woe is me. And he had this very, very um, uh, downtrodden look. And I, and I told him one time, I said, look, Zeb, you've got to get right back up in the game. You got to bounce back quick because if you don't, it's going to happen again. The ball's going to get by you again. You've got to learn from your mistake. You got to bounce back and get right back up. And businesses that are able to bounce back and say, you know what? We made a mistake. We lost some money. We learned something. Let's go on. Those are the businesses we're looking for. And is it revolutionary? Now, we're not talking about Facebook or Google or Microsoft here, something, you know, these things that change the world, Apple, uh, who knew, who knew we needed one of these gadgets until we had one, right? Uh, I was perfectly fine with my vinyl and my CDs, but it doesn't have to be that kind of revolutionary. If you know that people are having to drive 60, 100 miles, whatever, to buy children's clothing, putting in a children's clothing store in your community is revolutionary. If they're having to drive 30 minutes, an hour to buy a pair of shoes, putting in a shoe store in your community is revolutionary. If they're having to drive 45 minutes into town to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk, maybe putting in a convenience store or a neighborhood market or something out in the holler around here, everything looks close on a map where we live, but nothing, nothing is easy to get to. That's revolutionary. Making things accessible to your customers, maybe even just doing delivery. You know, starting a pharmacy in a community is not that revolutionary. But if you don't have a pharmacy, that's revolutionary. Making home delivery of the medications, that's revolutionary. Is there something that you're doing that people are not seeing? And that's the essence. That's the definition of an entrepreneur is that you see things others don't see and you bring it to life. You make it happen. So how do we look good on paper in light of the five R's of native credit? One is we got to focus on building relationships. We got to focus on those relationships that we have. We got to focus on the ones we can create. Are there people who can help our business? Do we have relationships with suppliers? Do we have relationships with our competitors? Do we have relationships in the community with, with, with people who provide services to our business, plumbers, electricians, those kinds of things? Show commitment to the community. Folks, we've got a pizza restaurant in Cherokee. The owners are not Cherokee. They moved to, Cher to Cherokee because they they wanted the lifestyle that we have here in the mountains. They 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 wanted to move away from franchise restaurants. They wanted to build their own restaurant selling pizzas, burgers, hot dogs, pretzels, things like that. And the way they showed commitment to the community is before they ever opened up, they called the high school and says, who's feeding the football team on Friday nights? You mean nobody's feeding the team on Friday night? We're going to feed the team on Friday nights. Tell us what time to be there with the food. We're going to deliver pizzas and drinks to the team. They started doing that for all the sports teams. They take care of the sports teams, and it showed good relationship-building skills. It showed that they were sincere about being part of the community. They weren't just some outsiders who, who came in and opened the doors and said, bring us your money, bring us your money. No. They wanted to be part of the community, and they they wanted to help out and by doing that with the sports teams. 
Show how you can build up and develop people through your business. Look, you if, if you're going to have a business that's beyond you, it's a people business. You've got to show how you can hire, train, develop, pay, and take care of people. Maybe you're just using contractors. Maybe, maybe you don't have employees. But again, how are you going to raise people up through your business? How can your business have a larger benefit than just you making money? It's important to the community that, and I, I don't really like the term giving back because that implies that someone gave you something, you owe it back to them, but giving, giving, just giving. Can you give to the community? Can you demonstrate? Do you participate in local events? Do you show up to judge competitions? Do you volunteer for things? Do you show up to deliver food when it's snowing or when the, there's inclement weather? Um, do you do you volunteer on the on the uh, for the fire department? What are the things that you're doing beyond yourself? And you have to have to have to be able to clearly explain the problem you're solving. Look, it doesn't matter what you do. We have 26 people on this webinar today, and you all do exactly, we all do exactly the same two things. Here they are. Number one, you solve a problem. If you're not solving a problem, what are you doing? Why do you want to start the business? You're solving a problem. And number two, you're creating a good feeling. Now, you don't have to have laser light shows and and, and fireworks to create a good feeling. Home delivery creates a good feeling. Taking care of your customers, knowing their names, uh, knowing their children, uh, knowing their, their birthdays and their anniversaries and saying, hey, I, I, I noticed it was your birthday on Monday. Sorry, we missed it. Glad to see you today, blah, blah, blah. Those are good feeling type things. If you can do both of those, if you can solve a problem and you can create a good feeling, that is a home run in any business. But lenders want to know that you can articulate what that problem is that you're solving. You have to know what it is. All right, here is a very, very simple business plan outline. Look, we all have these, these visions of, of term papers, research papers that we used to write in school and, oh, it was horrible and group projects and yada, yada, yada. No, your business plan is the story about your business. That's all it is. Let's break this down. Who will sell what to whom? Where, at what cost, and for what price? Boom. Answer those questions, and you've got it. Who are you? Let's talk about you for a second. If you don't blow your own horn, there's no music. You have to talk about you in your business plan. You have to talk about why you are uniquely qualified and capable to run this business and see it through to success. Again, if you don't believe in yourself, who will? You have to demonstrate that you are the person who's borrowing this money for this business, and this is the right investment for the lender. Who will sell what? Okay, we can talk about the technical specifications of what we do all day. We do medical billing. Uh, we we do uh, uh, we we make uh, crowns for teeth. Maybe I have an uh, uh, odontology office or whatever that's called. Anyway, I've got a business that I make crowns for local dentists. It doesn't matter. I can, I can groom. Dogs, doesn't matter. Go beyond what you sell and describe the problem you solve and the good feeling you create. Do both of those things and in, in talking about what you sell. To whom? We're going to talk just in a moment about your customers. You have to know your customers. Who are you selling to? Who is the most likely buyer for what you have to sell? Now, Remember, I said, if you're starting a business from a hobby, you have to go out and start a new hobby. But these are the easiest businesses to find customers for because you are your customer. You know who you are. You know that birds of a feather flock together. You know other people who like the same things, want the same things, complain about the same things, do the same things, show up in the same places, go to the same conventions and conferences and shop in the same places. You know those people because you are those people. So be able to describe those people. If you can define them, you can find them. I'm going to say that again. If you can define your customers, you can find your customers. 
The where is where do you need to be? Where do your customers expect you to be? Do you do you need to be on the internet and you can just chip out of your basement or a spare bedroom or a warehouse down the street? Do you need to have a storefront where tourists and customers can walk in the door? Where do your customers expect you to be? Remember, where does not describe where you want to be. Where is where will you locate based on your customer and what their needs are? If I'm having if I have a business on a second floor walk up of a two story building downtown somewhere and my customers have to climb a steep set of stairs, but my best customer is a retiree who may have bad knees may be on a walker, cane, wheelchair. Is that the best place just because it was cheap and it was available and I could put a sign in the window and everybody sees it? No. What is it going to cost you to deliver the services? What is it going to cost you both in terms of your fixed costs? What are your capital costs of setting this business up, putting in the equipment, furniture, fixtures, equipment, all the things that you need to do, marketing your business, but what does it also cost you to put your product or your service in the hands of your customer? What does it cost you to deliver? If you've ever watched even a single episode of Shark Tank, you know that this is one of their favorite gotcha questions. People who can answer the question of what are your costs or what is your cost structure, they sail through. They can do business with the sharks. If they even stumble for a second, they're going to get eaten alive. You have to be able to answer what is your cost? And pricing. Look, pricing is one of the most detailed, convoluted, frustrating, and important things you will do in your business. Creating your, your pricing is crucial to your success because you always have to walk this fine line. It's like walking along the top of a fence. You have to balance on one side, you have to balance being attractive to your customers. They have to want to pay what you are charging. The other is you have to be profitable for you. If you're too attractive to your customers, it might mean that you're too cheap. You're going to work yourself to death. They're going to buy everything you have. And you're going to be out of business. Too profitable might mean that your prices are so high that only a few people will buy what you want to sell. And maybe, maybe you don't have enough customers in that case. So again, you got to find that nice middle ground. Get some help with your pricing. There are uh, small business development centers, native CDFIs out there who can help you. Uh, you can contact the National Center. Uh, you can contact uh, Native CDFI Network. We will. We somebody there will point you in the right direction of who can sit down with you uh, and help you. Um, Almost all of us have access to something called SCORE, S-C-O-R. It's the Service Corps of Retired Executives. If you go to SCORE.org, they do about 75 or 80% of their counseling online. So you don't even have to be in front of them. But they, you, you, you type in what type of business you have, what help you're looking for, and they will put you with somebody who can help you work through your pricing model. So let's get back to who are your customers. Remember, I said, if you can define them, you can find them. The term that we're looking for now is avatar. Avatar. And I'm going to define that for you. If you want to write this down, you can. But but here's the key. Your customers are the people who pay you. They pay you. Your avatar is the ideal representation of your perfect customer. It's the ideal representation of your perfect customer. If I know that I'm starting a gym for muscle heads, uh, you know, I want to, I want to have, I want to have free weights. I want to have certain things in that gym that, that, that people who fit that profile are going to be looking for. Because if I have uh, Nautilus machines, uh, if it looks more like a, 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 a community gym than a, than a gold's gym, People are not going to take to it too kindly. They're going to say, wait a minute, I'm your avatar, and this is not designed for me. Know who that ideal perfect customer is. Your perfect customer is the person who, that one person, right? We're defining one person. We're not defining a population. We're defining one person. That one person who will buy everything you sell, no matter what the price. They'll use it. They'll tell their friends. They'll come back for more. They'll wait in the rain overnight 
to get in the door to buy to be the first one to buy the new thing that you have for sale. It's the, it's the people who camp out at the Apple stores. Uh, it's the people who used to camp outside of stadiums and arenas for concert tickets. We don't have to do that anymore. We have bots and uh, uh, I won't get into all of that because uh, uh, if you've tried to get Taylor Swift tickets, you know that uh, it might, it might just be easier to, to camp out in the rain, but know who your avatar is. You have to clearly define the problem that you're solving and you have to write down the problem. Write down the problem, write down how you solve that problem. Because if you can't articulate it, you can't solve it. You might think you can, but maybe you can't. What is the good feeling you create? Maybe the good feeling you create is that you just do this faster. You do it better than everybody else. You do not have to do it cheaper. That is not the good feeling. I don't want you to get a good feeling from being cheaper, being less expensive than everybody else, because that can put you out of business. My mantra has always been charge more than your competitors and give people a darn good reason to pay it. And you will find your family. You will find your people. Articulate your point of difference. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this guy. He's occasionally in the news. His name's Warren Buffett. He's invested over the years. He's done okay. And of course, if, if you don't know who Warren Buffett is, then I am joking completely because he is, he is a rock star when it comes to investing. And the point of difference, what he calls the durable competitive advantage this is what he looks for in every business he invests in. He says, I want to know what's going to keep this business profitable for the next 20 years. For a long time, he wouldn't invest in tech companies because he couldn't see what they were doing. He didn't understand what they would be doing. He's looking for a unique selling proposition that they, they will have an advantage with for decades to come. And if you can find what your advantage is, that thing that sets you apart, you scored. Okay. Tom Peters, a great author, a business author and guru. He, he says that you can either become distinct or you will become extinct, become distinct or extinct choice is yours. All right. Do you have everything together? Let's talk about getting ready to apply. I'm going to take a little break right here. We're going to come back to this. I'm going to mute my screen. I'm going to mute me. I'm going to set my timer over here to bring us back in five minutes. So stretch your legs, look away from the computer screen, get up, grab uh, some afternoon caffeine uh, or morning, depending on where you are. And uh, let's get back together in five.
Okay. We're back, sports fans. I did mention in the chat, but I'll mention now. If you have any questions, go ahead and drop those in the chat or the Q&A. We'll make sure we get to those. Uh, I do have a couple of slides that I think are are pretty informative, but they're not really pertinent to, to what we're talking about today because I, I added a little bit of content. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what those slides are when we get to them, but we'll, we'll kind of move on across them, and you can go back and read those uh, as time permits. And uh, if you need a little late night bedtime reading, that kind of thing, you you can do that. Otherwise, we're going to we're going to get right on with the meat of this topic. So you got to plan to plan. You got to prepare to apply. You got to put some things together to get ready. <clears throat> Excuse me. Regardless of whether you're going to a bank, to a CDFI or to another lender. You need banking statements for all of your borrowers. This is checking and, and saving statements, any kind of bank statements that you have. And this is generally anybody who owns 20% or more of the company. So if you're an 80% owner and you've got somebody who owns 20%, yep, they qualify. So uh, you've got to produce bank statements for this. Why do we need bank statements? Because bank statements, you can't hide anything from your bank statement. We can tell that you took your business debit card and you took your family out to dinner and you took them to a water park last week and you stopped to buy gas for your car. And maybe there are some things there that don't really look like business uh, expenditures, but then we start looking at your personal bank statements and we say, wait a minute, you bought a piece of equipment with your debit card. Uh, you wrote a personal check for some paper supplies. Um, we want to see that everything is segregated. We want to see that you have good bookkeeping habits. Uh, plus, we also want to see what you're spending money on uh, because that helps us make a determination of, of how you're going to spend money once we give you a check. We need to see two to three years of tax returns. Uh, tax returns just tell us, you know, are you filing everything? Are you reporting everything? Do you have some assets out there that maybe you didn't disclose? Maybe some things that could be used as collateral. There might be a reason why you don't want to use it as collateral, but we need to have that conversation. Uh, again, are you in trouble with Uncle Sam? We want to see that. Oh, you know, well, and you know, I didn't, I didn't report my tax. I haven't done my taxes in 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 five years. Well, when we start looking at how to get our money back. If things go south and you don't pay us, there are some remedies that lenders have to get that money back. But Uncle Sam can jump in front of every one of those with a tax lien. So we're not just going to pull your credit. We're going to see, is there potential for Uncle Sam to jump in front of us to collect money from you that would otherwise go to us? We want your business plan. In other words, we want to see the story. Where is this thing going? Convince us that this can be a reality and that it makes sense. We also need to see your personal financial statement. A PFS is something that you can Google, you can download it, you can you can get one of these and get them for free online. Uh, your bank will give you one. Uh, certainly, your lender will have one either in the application or they'll give you one in addition to the application that you'll need to complete. And it's just a list on one side. It says, what do you own? And the other side, what do you owe? What do you own and what's the value? Your home, your land, your car, your furnishings, your jewelry. And what do you owe? What's the balance that's owed on all those things, including your credit cards and everything else? And what's left over? That stuff that's left over is called your owner's equity or your equity. You want it to be positive. It may not be. For a lot of small businesses, You, if you look at your balance sheet, this is the equivalent of your balance sheet. You want it to be positive. You, you want to show that you're a good steward of the money you have so that you'll be a good steward of the money we give you. But we also want to see, is there something that's showing up on your credit report that you're not disclosing? Maybe you forgot about that Verizon bill that they came after you for and you owe them $2,000. Okay, very interesting. Was it an oversight or did you try to hide it from us? We also want to see that you owe Aunt Martha $5,000. It was a private loan. It's never going to show up on your credit report. But thank you for showing us that honesty, being up front and showing us that you owe Aunt Martha $5,000. There are different ways to go about getting money. We, we always think about the most obvious. Let's go to a bank, go to a bank, go to a bank, go to a CDFI. Okay. But what about our personal savings? 
is there money sitting in your account that you could use? Now, yes, it's often limited. A lot of times we don't have a lot of money sitting around. And the statistics are horrible, by the way. Something like 80% of Americans could not come up with $2,000 in the next 30 days if they had an emergency. That's staggering. It just means that people have a lot of debt. We're now at over, I think, $1 trillion or uh, I'm not even going to give you that number. I'm going to miss it. I'm going to mess it up. It's a huge, huge number, but we've just crossed the line on personal credit card debt in this country. It's higher than it's ever been, which means we've got a lot of credit card debt. We don't have a lot of savings. So there's no personal cushion. There's nothing there. So sometimes using your own money can put you in worse shape. You don't want to do that. Uh, can you go to friends, family, and acquaintances, or as we call it the bank of FFA, friends, family, and acquaintances? Look, this is going to get dicey, but I'm going to give you the skinny on how this works. You, you may have friends and family who believe in you. They love you. They want to give you money. And if they do, it's going to make family gatherings very awkward. When you play poker on Friday night and with your friends and they've given you money, it's going to be very awkward. Make sure that if you set up a loan with friends, family, and acquaintances, that you set it up as if they were a bank documentation. You want to know where their limits are, that they can't walk in the door and tell you how to run your business now, because they're going to want to say, they're going to want to tell you how to do it. And look, half the people in your life already think you're crazy. They think you're nuts for wanting to start a business. Why would anybody want to start a business? Why wouldn't you just go out and get a job? Folks, there is no job security anymore. There's nothing uh, of the sort. There never has been. So getting a job might be the crazy option. But the ones who believe in you may be willing to give you money, set it up, use a lawyer, use a lawyer, use a lawyer, set it up as if you were borrowing the, the money from a bank. If you put all of the pawn shops in the United States together, brought them together as one entity, put the same sign on the front of every one of them, they would be the seventh largest bank in the world, world, not the country, be the seventh largest bank in the world. Pawn shops do an amazing amount of business lending that nobody ever talks about. It's expensive, um, but it's there. Credit cards are expensive. And of course, like I said, loan sharks. Now, you might think I'm joking about loan sharks. Uh, I, 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 I work in Cherokee, North Carolina. I've lived in the mountains of North Carolina all my life. And trust me, you do not have to live in uh, New York, Chicago, L.A., uh, places where there are mob figures and, and daily news about gangsters to have loan sharks. A lot of times it could be a family member who is well known for lending money and high interest rates. Doesn't necessarily mean that that uh, that person is going to come after you with a baseball bat, but they're going to charge you usury levels of interest, which just means exorbitant levels of interest. Think about this. The quicker you're able to get the money, the more it's going to cost you in the long run. Fast money is expensive money. Don't go the fast route. Go a route that's that's going to take more patience. It's going to take more time. It's going to be, yeah, a few more headaches, a lot of paperwork, but it's going to be worth it in the end. You want to find a lender who is a good fit, which means you need to start setting up relationships. You already bank, if you bank, Ah, let me back up just a second, because maybe you don't bank with anybody. If you don't bank, if you don't have a banking relationship right now, Monday morning, take 50 bucks, 100 bucks, whatever the minimum is, and go to a bank. It doesn't have to be your favorite bank, just a bank. Open a savings account. A lot of banks will let you open a savings account with as little as $50, $100. Take that money and open an account. Guess what, folks? You now have a relationship. When you have a depository account with a bank, they know you. They may not know you well. Doesn't mean that you're in there dropping big Benjamins every Friday and depositing those, but they know you. Do you have a relationship with a bank? That is your first place to go. Doesn't mean that they're going to say yes. They may say, 
Russ, we love you. We think this is a great idea, but by policy, you're a startup and we can't deal with a business that's under two years old. You show us two years of cash flow history. We'll we'll talk. You come back and we'll do business with you. Until then, policy says we just can't do it. Doesn't mean I'm a bad person. This means they can't limit the money. So do they know you? Do they have a relationship? And do they understand your business? Do they understand your industry? Look, if I wanted to start a paper company today, there's only one bank in the entire United States. It's a it's a branch of Chase Bank down in Houston, Texas. I think it's in Houston. I would have to go down there and make my case. They're the only people who are going to lend me money for a paper mill. There's going to be somebody out there who understands your business, who gets your industry. And they're going to be able to accept the risk that comes along with it because hotels are all they do. You're starting a hotel. You're a natural fit. You're starting a cannabis business. Well, that's a little different story because until it's de until it's decriminalized at the federal level, a lot of banks are just going to shy away from it. Firearms, uh, adult businesses, they're all the same uh, in that regard that banks are going to regulate by just saying we don't have an appetite for that. But do they understand you? Do they offer services that you're going to need? Are you going to need a, a banking card, a, a, a credit card for your business? Are you going to need to be able to take credit card payments? Are they going to set up merchant services for you? Are you going to need to take overseas wire transfers? Are you going to need to set up uh, investment accounts? Uh, are you going to need back office services like payroll? A lot of banks do that nowadays. They say, look, we've already got your money. We can handle your payroll and everything else. Can they facilitate your growth and can they grow with you? Or are they going to say, you're too big for us now, we're going to have to send you somewhere else? And what does your gut tell you? Do you get a good feeling from these people? When you have a conversation with them, do they want to know about you? Are they genuinely interested? Or do they seem like they want to get you out the door? What do you, you're, you're, the, the hair on the back of your neck stands up for a reason. There's, there's something physiological about not having a good feeling about someone. If your gut's telling you that this might be a place where I can have a relationship, maybe not today, but maybe in a couple of years, cultivate that relationship. Now, these are the slides that we're going to move past. I'm just going to I'm just going to hit these highlights and say that in in 1994, the CDFI industry was born. We were supposed to go away in 2004. We had a 10 year shelf life. Community Development Finance Institutions are those institutions that were set up to put money into underbanked, underserved, underrepresented communities. Because Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Chase, they don't have incentive to go into a small town, to a reservation, to build a big branch office. There's just no financial incentive for it. So if they can put their money into those communities through CDFIs, everybody wins. Well, there are, there's just under 70 native CDFIs right now, and it's nowhere near enough. But I've given you a locator here. If you want to go to the CDFI locator, there are, there are CDFIs, and maybe you live in an area where you don't have a native CDFI that serves your tribe. But you may be able to find a CDFI that serves your state, that serves your county, that serves your area. There's also the native CDFI network, we can point you in the direction of help because there are native CDFIs that cover multiple states that 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 are not tribe specific. You know, we are Eastern Band of Cherokee, uh, but there, there are other CDFIs out there that could help uh, members of other tribes. So again, be looking for those. Uh, if the bank tells you no, it doesn't mean that you're a bad person. It may just say that by policy, we're tapped out. We can't do this. CDFI is your next best solution. But you have to you have to give us the same answers that you give banks. We still want to know how much money do you want. Now, the, in the old days, it was it was not really true. But a lot of people thought, I need $100,000, so I'm going to ask for $150,000. Because I want to just put $50,000 in the bank. I want to let it sit there and hold it for a rainy day. No, that's never been the case. We have to be very specific in how much money we're looking for. I'm going to give you two tools to help do that, but you have to know what is the money I'm looking for? What's it going to be used for? Don't ask for more than you need because they won't give it to you. And then get help from a small business center, small business development center, from SCORE, from a native CDFI, from, from a community development corporation or an advisor. 
maybe it's just someone who is in your family who's been running a business for years and they know their stuff. Sit down and talk with them. Tap into that knowledge. Tap into that experience. Let them help you determine how much money you need to start your business. So let's talk about these tools that uh, that I'm going to give you. One is your break even. Break even is the point at which you have paid all of your expenses and now you get into where you're making money. Think of your break even as the high jump bar. If I have a coffee shop and I have to sell 350 cups of coffee every day just to get over the bar and start making money, 350 cups of coffee is how high the bar is. If I sell 300 cups of coffee, I've not paid my bills. I've not paid for the uh, the expenses of running that business. Once I get over that bar, then I start making money. We have to know where the bar is or we're going to miss it. So this is what it looks like. Every business has fixed costs. The blue line there, we know that fixed costs are overhead. Those are the things that we're going to pay every month, no matter what. Um, it's it's going to be, uh, oh, and Cynthia, I'm, I'm hoping you're saying you're going to ask for a loan for 5000 and then make an extra 5000 That's That's what we all want to hear. <laughs> or 50000 or 500000 um, But, uh, or, or putting, or putting in, putting in your own 5,000 to match that. Yes, that's exactly what we like to see. Um, but your your overhead, you, you've got to pay that no matter what. You, you've got to pay to keep the lights on. Um, if you're paying somebody to stand behind the counter in your candy shop, you've got to pay that person because they can't just they can't just clock in when somebody wants to buy something. They have to be there. So those fixed costs are there no matter what. Now, beginning on top of that, you'll see a red line that starts right where that blue line is. And those are your variable costs. If you're selling tangible goods, if you're selling inventory, everything that you sell, you have to replace. If I'm selling hot dogs, I've got to replace the hot dogs, the buns, the condiments, the paper boat, the napkins, the Coke, the chips, whatever it goes with it. Variable costs, cost of goods sold, these are anything that goes home with your customer. If I'm selling T-shirts, it's the T-shirts, the ink, the you know the plastic shopping bag that I'm sending them out the door with. All of those things are cost of goods sold. But my sales, until they cross both of those lines, I've not broken even yet. So I'm giving you two calculations here. Again, you're going to want to download this. Hang on to these. You're going to want to do these calculations. Your break-even point is going to tell you how high the bar is every day when you, uh, when you get out of bed. How much do you have to sell to break even? Break-even point is going to help you predict changes in your pricing, uh, what are the relationship between your fixed and variable costs? And um, what if you do something that makes you more efficient, that, that helps you do things better? Does it make you more profitable? You want to know that. Well, this is what these uh, two calculations can do for you. Very simple calculations, but extremely powerful. Uh, next is we're going to look at cash flow. Now, I'm not going to walk through cash flow with you, but at the end, got something beautiful for you. You can download uh, a spreadsheet. We've got a spreadsheet. All you do is you fill it in. You you want to download. Don't don't go online and start editing it because that, that messes it up. Download it first. Get that spreadsheet downloaded. You put in the raw numbers and it will graph your cash flow. And cash flow is really important because all we're looking at is cash in and cash out. We're not looking at um You've got this big bill that's going to be due in six months. We only care about six months from now when that cash goes out. Will you have enough cash to pay that bill? This spreadsheet is going to help you determine how much money you need to borrow. That's Oh, it's a thing of beauty. Now, when I say think globally, act locally, this is not like the old recycling thing that we used to talk about. No. Lenders look at something called global cash flow, which means we're looking at all the money in your life, not just in your business, all the money in your life, where is it coming from? Where is it going? Did you hit the lottery and you're taking an annuity? Do you have a uh, an insurance payout? Did your grandmother leave you some money in her will? Uh, do you have a second job? Um, you know, is your kid Justin Bieber and you're making money on the royalties? What's going on here? You're getting all this money from your, from other places in your life, your spouse's income, Maybe you've got some social security income and all that money, where's that going? What's it taking care of? And here's the deal. Your business 
has to show that it can pay its own bills. And if we're going to replace all that other stuff out there and make the business pay those bills, that puts a lot of pressure on your business. So we want to know, is there going to be enough money out there to put bread on your table and put a roof over your head without relying on the business? That's global cash flow. And then we're going to act locally because we're really going to hone in on how is the business going to maximize its income potential? What are you going to do with all that money? You can't just say, I want money. Give me my money. Got to have some money from my business. You got to tell us what you're doing with it. You can use it for facilities. They're going to build a structure. They're going to build a loading dock. Uh, is it going to be for furniture, fixtures, and equipment? That's what FFE stands for, furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Are you going to be putting in a new cash register, a new POS system? Are you going to be putting in some new manufacturing equipment? Are you going to buy a forklift? What is going on here? Inventory. This is everything that's going to be resold and it's going to go out the door with your customers. If I have an outdoor uh, store, if I have a garden center, it's my planters, it's my containers, it's all that stuff. It's the dirt that I send out the door with my customers. Working capital. If I have a farm, it's going to be my fertilizer. It's going to be my feed, my seed, my fuel. It's going to be uh, rent, insurance, all that overhead stuff, right? I've got to pay the bills until the business stands on its own. But if there are two things that you remember from this, one is that long-term money is for long-term assets. If you're if you're borrowing money for inventory, you're, you're only going to want that money for a maximum of a year. You don't want to be paying on that inventory in 10 years after you've already sold it on day one. Long-term money for long-term assets and short-term money for short-term assets. This is where you might get a loan to build your building, equip your building, take care of your working capital, and for your inventory, you put that on a credit card. Now, I'm not advocating a credit card, but I'm saying that's an option. It's short-term money for short-term assets. Is this money going to be good for the business or am I just wanting money to pad for a rainy day for a what if moment? Is it going to help me improve my productivity? Is it going to help me go into a new market? Is it going to give me capital to help me grow and scale? And let me stop for a second and talk about those two words. Very, very different scenarios. My grandfather was a barber for 65 years. And the only way he could grow his business was work faster, cut more hair, charge more, stay open longer, those kinds of things. But he could never scale his business because he was a one-man shop. The only way to scale the business would be to open another shop, fund it, take a cut of everybody else's haircuts, or put in a second chair in his shop and rent it out to someone else. And he, now he's getting rent. Growth is putting in more to get out more. Scale is getting out more without having to put more in. You're getting more out than you're putting in. We want to scale businesses. Growth is good. Scale is better. So let's take the last few minutes and let's talk about what ifs. Okay. we all, Remember I said that we, we always plan for what if things go wrong. That, that's good. We want to have those plans. We want to have a worst case scenario contingency plan. What does the worst case look like? What happens if the bottom falls out of this? Well, we're going to need an emergency budget. The emergency budget, a lot of people say, well, if things go bad in the business, I'm going to start cutting my suppliers. I'm going to stop paying my suppliers. I'm going to buy cheaper ingredients. I'm going to stay open less. I'm going to fire some people. Every bit of what I just mentioned hurts the business. What can you cut out of your life to keep the business healthy? to give the business a runway to get back on its feet. What can you cut? Can you cut out the cable, the subscription services? Can you sell the fancy new car and get yourself an old beater? Can you, can you get rid of things in your life that will help the business? Okay. The beans and bacon budget. Um, and we need to weigh every risk. Every business has risk. Now, there are three different types of risk that I identify. One is market risk. In other words, people's tastes, they change. Beanie Babies, selling those on eBay, maybe that'll come back someday, but I just don't see it. But there are a lot of people with probably tons of Beanie Babies hoping that market comes back. There's economic risk. Look, if I have a business that relies on fuel and fuel costs spike, that's going to hurt me. Uh, if I'm in a tourism heavy economy and tourism is not here, that's going to hurt me. Are there risks there that I need to be aware of? 
There are inherent risks. If I have a roofing company or a tree company and somebody could fall or I could drop something, uh, uh, cut a tree and it drops on somebody's house or their RV, there's inherent risk in that. Those are risky businesses. If I have a skating rink, somebody could fall and get hurt. That's a risky business. Show your lender that you're thinking of these things. You don't have to be in the weeds so far that you plan for every little thing that could possibly happen. You know, the meteor hits us. You, you don't have to go that far. But we want to know that you're thinking in terms of risk and worst case scenario. But what happens if you go to bed in a rowboat and you wake up on a cruise ship? Well, all kinds of things can happen because of fast growth. Can you monitor and control how fast you're burning through your cash. You, you may need to borrow money today instead of waiting till next week to get the money. Growth brings people issues. People are messy. Humans are messy, messy. Uh, they, they do dumb things. They don't do what you want them to do. Uh, they don't show up for work. They, I mean, humans are just messy. They bring their problems to work. They bring their kids to work. I mean, you name it. Rapid growth requires that you have policies, procedures, processes, everything in place to deal with whatever humans bring to the equation. And do you have the leadership skills necessary to drive the cruise ship? I've seen way too many businesses over the last 30 years or so that have strangled the business to death by hanging on to it too long. Businesses that we've met with and said, look, you need, you're at a point now, you need to hire professional management. You need to hire a CEO. You need to, you need somebody who's been down this road before who can get you to the next level. And their response is, this is my baby. Nobody else is going to run this company. I'm going to, I'm going to see it through. I'm going to be the one to drive this plane. And where they drive it is all the way into the ground. Don't be that person. Know when to step back. Know when to gain something. Maybe you need just training. Maybe training. Maybe some coaching is all you need to get you to that next level. But whatever it is, don't strangle your business. All right, so let's talk about a few things here that uh, that, are, that COVID brought up. And that some of these are just generalizations. Look, in general, communicate, communicate, communicate. Don't be a thorn in the side of your lender, but communicate. Lenders can only move as fast as you. If you're not providing them with information, sometimes they're just going to stop processing your request. So if they ask for tax documents, get them the tax documents. If they ask for bank statements, get them the bank statements. If they ask them for your resume, give them a resume. If they want to see what is your experience in this industry, be able to show them documented proof that you have certifications, that you have um, you have an education background in this in this industry. Maybe you've spent the last 20 years in this industry. Whatever it is, get it to them. Understand what your industry standards are, because I promise you, your lender is going to look into industry standards. We have we have access to databases. We have access to information where we can learn about your industry. And if we find out something about your industry that you don't know, and we say, well, you know, the industry standard in your for your business is uh, X number of dollars per square foot per year in sales. Why are you nowhere close to that? Oh, did you not know that? You need to understand your industry. Every no that you get, every set of eyeballs that that looks at your business plan is going to give you some sort of feedback. Polish that business plan. Give it a good once over. Every no that you get is an education. Every time somebody hands you that business plan and says, I have a question about this, answer that question. Fix it. Make it so that when people read it, they get a great picture of where your business is going and they know exactly what they're looking at. Be organized. Um, look, I had a guy come to me last month. He brought me a three inch, I'm, I'm sorry, a two inch three ring binder. It was labeled, it was indexed, it was color coded. Everything was in there. Everything everything that I want in a business plan in a in a in a proposal he had his loan application in there everything was there he asked for a hundred thousand dollars is the fastest hundred thousand dollar loan we've processed in years because he was so organized 
and he's willing to invest in himself. He showed that he was already doing this. He was betting on himself before he walked in the door. Expect a no. Everybody you talk to, expect them to say no, but plan for yes. What if they say yes? Oh, now what? Where's What's the next step? Banks are getting tighter right now. They're, they're lending less money. They're making it harder to borrow money. Be prepared. You're probably going to need to put your, more of your own money in. You're probably going to need more collateral. And just know that your industry may not be attractive to a lender right now. But if you have sales, if you have a track record of doing this, that's going to get their attention. You may need a partner. Maybe your credit score isn't great, but your idea is get a partner. Have someone else come in and invest with you. But whatever you do, start now. Don't quit. The best time to plant a tree was what? 20 years ago. The, best, the second best time is today. Get started now. Take this weekend to kind of put all these things together. You'll be ready to go by Monday. I promise you, you you'll be ready to sit down with a banker or a lender next week. This is what you came for. This is, uh, is going to wrap us up here today. Go ahead and use these free tools. Today's slide deck is a PDF slide deck. You can download it on any uh, computer. Uh, it's going to give you all the slides. The free business plan template that I told you, you can print that out. You can start now. It's a great way to get that information out on paper. The cash flow worksheet. Oh, you're going to love this. If you know anything about Excel, it's and even if you don't, it's super simple to use. It's color coded. You fill in the blue, uh, the blue fields, and you're done. Now, the stuff at the top is the most important because anybody, anybody, I do a webinar for. This is the deal that I make. You can contact me. Send me an email. Call me. You say, Russ, I was in this webinar uh, with IDRS on Friday. Uh, I've got a question, and isn't that the way it always works? That Three o'clock in the morning, you're going to sit straight up in bed and say, oh, I wish I'd asked this. So if you got a question, you can always call on me. I don't charge for that. This is part of the deal when I when I do these webinars. Uh, I want to make sure that you got it. I want to make sure that you get where you, where you need to go and, and get the information you need. I will hang on here. I know that our time is up. For those of you who need the rest of your day back, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with me. Uh, and, uh, I will hang out as long as you need me to, if you've got any questions, I don't see any in the chat or the Q and a, but if you want to throw those in there, I'll hang out here until, until I get cut off. Otherwise have a great weekend. And I hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much for us. If you guys have questions, throw them in the chat. We'll hang on for just a few minutes. Uh, like always, we will send you a copy of this presentation. Get it emailed to you so you can watch it five more times because there was so much information. I'm going to have to watch this few times. Not to mention all the great things for us. I love I love the southern flair. <laughs> I'll never escape this accent, so it is what it is. <laughs>